All right, well, thanks for joining us this morning. It's a blessing to have you all here. This morning, we're going to be looking at uh, principles that we need to bring to bear in our lives when we are confronting patterns of sin. And I'm going to start by just sharing with you that uh, there's more trepidation and more sobriety at the same time as I share this than with anything else that's in my life, because uh, just like every one of you, uh, I battle sin every day, did so this morning already. Um, But my heart in this is that this would be a blessing to all of you, and it would assist you as you exist in the same mixed condition as every other believer. So I'm going to need some help from the Lord. So let's do this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Lord in heaven, we are standing here before you. We have access to you. We can look at your word with eyes that discern and perceive and understand, not because of anything of us, but because of you and what you have done for us. Lord, that you and your kindness have rescued us from the circumstances of our lives, and you have drawn us into your marvelous kingdom. And we enjoy a relationship with you, not because of anything that we have done, but because of your choice of us and your graces at work within us. On an ongoing way, Lord, I pray that today, as we talk about sin and we talk about confronting sin and addressing sin, that you would use this time, you would use the strength and the authority and the power and the clarity of your word to help us, to help us lead lives that are more pleasing and more honoring to you. Lord, I pray that this time would be a time in which Grace Bible Church grows. We would grow as people before you who are more earnest in our pursuit of you, more diligent in our pursuit of you. And Lord, as such, we would be ones who view you rightly and view our sin rightly. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. As I said, we're going to be looking at 10 principles to consider when addressing and confronting patterns of sin in your life. Um, Sin will always be present with us in this age. Uh, We know that. We know that there is a day coming when uh, Christ will return to this earth to take his church to be with him. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive will observe that and be gathered up in the clouds together with Christ. And we know that in that condition, we will be sinless. And uh, so we're not there yet. We're, every believer is looking forward to that day and that time, and uh, we should. Uh, but th- what that means is we are here in a life where sin is continually with us. What I'm going to share today is, is how we can use principles from God's Word to help us confront that sin and address that sin in our life. Uh, There's much more that can be said about this than what I'm going to share today. I only have 57 more minutes to go, so um, there's much, much more. For example, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit and its work in our life. I'm not talking about our testimony to the unbelieving world around us. Many other things are being left out, but for the interest of time, I I pick 10 things, and I I truly hope that they are a blessing to all of you. Uh, We are going to have this available on the church website. I think it is already uh, the outline with the passages that I'm going to be listing Uh, So that's going to be available as well. What we're going to start by looking at is five essential characteristics in the person when they're addressing and confronting sin in their life. And after that, I'm going to list five considerations that we need to be aware of as we think about this. So let's start talking about uh, characteristics that are true in a person as they are addressing patterns of sin in their life. And the first of these is a fear of God. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 130. This is so helpful to us. The fear of God can be described in basic terms as a sobriety that's based on an accurate understanding of God's character. And we're going to see that in Psalm 130. What's really interesting about Psalm 130 is that the psalmist starts by speaking of the the grandeur of God, and he starts by speaking of the the magnitude and the quantity of our sin. In verse 3, he writes, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Some translations don't say mark, some translations say number. Uh, The idea here is that in marking or numbering sin, uh, the scope of our sin is in view, the magnitude of it over the course of our lives. And it's something that should lead us to know with certainty that we have no basis to stand before God on our own. So the understanding is that we're very, very sinful before a holy God. But then we look further and we see what God's purpose is, and God forgives us. We see that there is forgiveness with God. We see that God is a God who can forgive massive quantities of sin. Well, we see why it is that God does that. In verse 4, God forgives us that he may be feared, that we may actually fear him. 
And so God's purpose in forgiving us is that we would fear him. And it's really helpful for us to see where fear stands next to lots of other things that God would help us and have us do before him. And that helps us understand a little bit more about what it means to fear God. And the subject of fearing God is probably a lesson all of its own. It's one that's probably going to be added to build and wellspring in the years to come and what it really looks like. But let's do this. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we'll get a feel for fear of God um, as it stands next to other things that we are to have in our relationship with God. The context here in Deuteronomy 6 is that Israel has been in the wilderness for 40 years and they are on the east side of the Jordan River and they are ready to cross the Jordan and enter into the promised land. And God is giving them the second giving of the law. And we know this. We know that in chapter 6, verse 5, God starts telling them about the kind of relationship that he wants them to have with him. And we see that God is a relational God because in verse 5, he says, you shall love the Lord your God. So God is a God of relationship. And part of that relationship is a love relationship that he has with his people. But if you drop down to verse 13, you see that God says, you shall fear me. So you've got this idea of being in a love relationship with God and fear of God is there together with love for God. So they have to play together. Drop down to verse 16. You see that we are not to put God to the test. And so the fear of God, the love for God, not putting God to the test, they all stand in the same relationship with God. And then you see obedience and service to God in verse 18. You shall do what is right, that it all may be well with you. All of this is in the context of things being well with you. So the fear of God, the love of God, the obedience to God, the service to God, not putting God to test, they all exist together in a right relationship with God. So the fear of God is not really in conflict with the love of God or service of God or obedience to him. God expected the Jew to love him and to fear him and to serve him all together in full measure. Now, Ben mentioned this yesterday in Build. It was so helpful, I, I added it at the last minute. In Proverbs 28, 14, how blessed is the man who fears you. So this is not the idea of somebody cowering in the corner before God. It is somebody who has a close relationship with God. There is blessing in fearing God. But when you continue reading Proverbs 28, 14, you see the contrast that, that a fear of God has with something else. It says, how blessed is the man who fears always, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. So we have a conflict here. We have a contrast. You have the fear of God on one hand that, that motivates obedience. And on the other side of that, you have disobedience. You have a hardening of heart. So a lack of obedience to God is rooted in a lack of fear for God. And so this relates to patterns of sin. I'll say one more passage that is really helpful for us to look at. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn to the last two verses in the book of Ecclesiastes? You can get there by turning to the Song of Solomon and then turning back two verses. And it'd be good. We're going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and verse 14. Solomon writes, The end of the matter, all that has been heard, after everything else has been said, all of these words that he's written. He's written 12 chapters about life and the meaning of it and the vanity of it and everything else. He says, fear God and keep his commands because this is the end of the matter for all of mankind. So if we have the pattern of sin in our lives and it's an ongoing pattern, a pattern that's been there for days and weeks and months, maybe even years, maybe even decades. What we need to do is we need to examine our fear of the Lord Consider the nature of your own fear for God. How would you explain your fear of God to a friend? Is it a closeness to him that compels you to obey him? But consider that. Practically speaking, if there's a pattern of sin in your life that is ongoing, do a study of the fear of God. Look at all that's true about God and what what scripture says about God. And then consider what it means to actually fear him rightly and live in a, a love relationship with him that's characterized by a love for him, a fear for him, a service to him all the things that God expected from Israel. Secondly, if we're going to have an ongoing pattern of sin in your life, there's something that that needs to be true if you want to confront that sin and root it out effectively, and that is a love for Christ. Let's turn to John 14. Uh, We're just going to look at two passages this morning. We're going to look at John 14, and I'm briefly going to mention Romans 5. When Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, it's one of the shorter verses that you can memorize. If you want to add another verse to your memorization list, John 14, 15 is a good one. It's good for a lot of reasons. Um, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, it's very important for us to understand that at conversion, at regeneration, God pours his love into us. 
Romans 5, 5 tells us that the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. So at the point of regeneration, we are made into new creations. And one of the things that characterizes us as new creations is we have the ability to actually love God. And that's not something we gin up within ourselves. It's because God poured that love into us. But with time, our love for Christ grows. And as our love for Christ grows, so does our obedience to Christ. So obedience to Christ is an expression of our love for him. When Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. The way you express your love for Christ is that you obey him. But obedience to Christ in greater measure is an expression of greater love for him. So as you continue to obey Christ in greater and greater areas of your life, that's demonstrating a greater and greater love for Christ. But the reality of the the matter is that if there's a pattern of sin in our life, in that moment where we're exercising that sin, whatever it is, whether it's a sin that takes place entirely within your mind, or it's a sin that takes place on your lips or anything else, the truth is that in that moment, our love for that sin and engaging with that sin is greater than our love for Christ. That's not to say that a person doesn't love Christ at all. It's to say that in that moment, a believer is choosing to love their sin more. So if uh, there's a pattern of sin in your life, then there's something that's really important that we need to do. Now let's consider the extent of your love for Christ. And just ask yourself this question. This is really helpful. Are you comfortable with the reality that in the moment of sin, you're engaging in a pattern of sin, that your affections for that sin are greater than your affections for Christ? And I'll raise my hand and tell you that I, I have to say yes on that at, on many occasions when I fall into patterns of sin. Uh, the practical advice for us on those days is to study Christ's love for us and his devotion to us by what he did for us at the cross and have that fuel our obedience to him. So a love for Christ is essential as you're confronting patterns of sin in your life. Third thing we're going to look at this morning that's essential in our pursuit of Christ and pursuit of rooting out sin from our life is godly sorrow over our sin. There's only one verse here. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to look at verse 10. The context here is important to understand. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Paul established the church in Corinth on his second missionary journey, but between his second and his third missionary journeys, false teaching had entered into the church. And some within the church had rallied around those false teachers. Paul actually visited them to correct the false teaching problem. And there were some within the church, and one man in particular, who led the group of people against Paul. It was not an effective time. Paul left him with a very heavy heart. He went back to the church in Ephesus, where he was teaching for a period of three years. He wrote what's called the, the sorrowful letter. It's the third letter he wrote to them, and Titus delivered it to them. And it was a very effective letter, and Titus was a very effective man in taking the, the letter to them, because the man who actually led the re- rebellion against Paul Uh, was caught in his sin, and he was put out of the church in fellowship, and he became broken over his sin. And there was clear evidence in 2 Corinthians that the man was broken over his sin, and he was repentant. And Paul is describing that man here in verse 10. He says, godly sorrow produces a repentance. So godly sorrow produces a repentance from patterns of sin. It's a repentance without regret. It leads to salvation, but the sorrow of the world brings death. So godly sorrow is the foundation for biblical repentance. Um, If you're working on a pattern of sin in your life, uh, you're really not going to go anywhere until you have godly sorrow over that sin. And I can say that again from my own life. I know that. Um, One of the things that we need to remember when we're considering repentance against sin is that you've got to start with godly sorrow. And we say to ourselves, well, how do I get godly sorrow? I would love to have that godly sorrow if it means I can be done with this pattern of sin. It starts by recognizing that your offense, first and foremost, is against God. We may have sinned against another person. We may have tarnished the the reputation of the gospel. We may have done a number of other things. But the fact is that when we are in patterns of sin, we are violating the instructions that God gave us. That is how we know that we are, first and foremost, in sin against God. And a brokenness over violating the instructions that God gave us for our good that we would grow in our holiness and we would be prepared and ready for Christ when he comes to take us to be with him. So if there's a pattern of sin in your life, then examine your sorrow over your sin. What kind of sorrow is it? Is it a sorrow that first and foremost is rooted in the fact that you have offended the God who saved you? Um, If not, uh, you need to be very, very thoughtful and very careful about that. 
Inform yourself to the extent that your sin is offense against God. Consider what God has overcome in you by putting Christ on the cross and use that to fuel your repentance from that pattern of sin. A fourth characteristic, a fourth characteristic that is very important, it is vital, and it is essential in confronting sin in your life is an effective prayer life. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 5.17. You actually uh, don't need to turn there. There's only three words in the verse. It says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. I'm going to mention another passage as well. I'm going to mention Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. A few more words in this verse. But 1 Thess 5, 17 is describing an ongoing pattern of prayer in a person's life. That means that throughout their day, they're communicating with God. They have an open path of communication with the Lord whether they're exercising, whether they're doing the dishes, whether they're driving, uh, whatever it is they're doing. They're not praying throughout their entire day. They are, they are praying across their day. It's evident that they have a prayer relationship with God. That's what 1 Thess 5, 17 is speaking to. Jesus speaks to another aspect of prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Before he says, when you pray, pray in this way. In verse 6, he actually tells us the mindset that we need to have when we're praying. And some of the disposition we need to have. And there were many people in that day who would pray publicly. And they would pray as a matter of advertisement and a matter of pride. And a matter of hypocrisy. But Jesus says in Matthew 6, 6, when you pray, go into your inner room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. There's the idea here of a person. He's not doing anything else. He's in his room. He's not browsing the internet. He's not watching TV. He's not sleeping. He's alone with God and he's dealing with God over his own life. And what is he doing? He's worshiping God. He's giving God the praise that is due to God. But he's also agreeing with God. He's agreeing with God about his own sin. He's confessing his sin to God. He's thanking God for God's kindness and God's goodness to him to forgive him for that sin. And he is asking God for help to walk in newness of life. And so these two things, uh, an effective prayer life is a prayer life that is continual throughout your day, but it's also characterized by a person who, who sits alone with God. Those things are both true when we talk about our prayer lives. And in, in the context of those prayer lives, when you maintain an ongoing prayer life with God, you're maintaining an ongoing confession over your sin. And you're maintaining an ongoing asking of God for help with your sin. And he is faithful. When you approach the throne of grace, you approach, Approach a throne that is a place where you find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4. It is essential that you have an active prayer life if you're going to confront the pattern of sin in your life. So in summary, if there's a consistent pattern of sin in your life, just ask yourself, is there a consistent pattern of prayer in my life? Practically speaking, just ask yourself, what is the state of your prayer life when you're lingering near a pattern of sin. And again, it could be a pattern of sin that you maintain in your mind. Maybe you envy, maybe you're jealous, maybe you're proud, maybe you're impatient. Maybe it's something you actually do with your eyes or your hands or your mouth, your lips, your feet. And just ask yourself, how well have you cultivated the practice of actually talking with God and communicating with him? Read your Bible where he communicates with you, close your eyes and pray back to him about your patterns of sin. The fifth thing that we need to look at when we're confronting patterns of sin in our lives, and this is essential that we have in our life, is an effective knowledge of scripture. Let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 119. And uh, you know that Psalm 119, I think it's all but three of those 176 verses actually mention the word of God. Look at verse 11. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. What do you think the key word is here that we're going to focus on? Treasured. We might know the word. We might actually have memorized it. We may have studied it. We may be able to diagram it. We might be able to diagram it in another language, like the original language is. We may have actually defended it before unbelievers. Uh, but that's not the same thing as actually treasuring God's word. And we're going to get a look at that here in a minute. But let's take a look at what the picture of God's word looks like in the life of the unbeliever. And I'm so thankful for my wife. She explained this verse to me just a, 
a week or so ago. She brought it to my attention. I was going to run right to Hebrews 4.12 and tell us all about the Word of God, which we will do, but I'm going to mention verse 2 first. This is what the, the Word of God looks like in the life of the unbeliever. And the apostle, well, no, the apostle, the author is writing, and he's describing the fathers. He's describing historical Old Testament men, probably women as well. And he says, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them. So they were hearing the word all the time. It didn't profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Uh, So the first thing is, uh, if there's a pattern of sin in your life and you're not a believer, uh, you need faith. You need saving faith in Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your master. You have no hope of repenting from any sin until you submit to the Lordship of Christ in your life. Let's drop down 10 verses to verse 12, where the, uh, the author writes, The word of God is living, and it is active, and it is sharp, and is able to judge. The attributes of God's word are the reasons why I should treasure it because of what it is and who it comes from. It's the word of God. It's not some other word. It's actually the breathed out heart and mind of God. These are his thoughts. These are his affections. This is his knowledge of what he says is right and good. That's why we should treasure it. It's living. God's heart 3,500 years ago when Job and Moses and so forth were writing the first pages of scripture is the very same heart that he has today. The words that we have today in front of us that you're holding in your lap, they carry the same force that they carried 3,500 years ago. So God's word is living, it's enduring, it's also active. It has immense power. I want us to turn to Isaiah 55. It's not in our list, but Isaiah 55 is really helpful. We're going to look at verse 10 and 11. In verse 10, God is giving us a picture of all of the things that he provides He says, as the rain and the snow came down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and giving seed to the sower and bread to the water. Uh, So he's saying, okay, there is water coming down and it has blessing. It has accomplishment. I send the rain and it accomplishes its purpose. Verse 11, he, he equates that with his word. He says, so my word, so will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what pleases me and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. God's word is powerful. He delivered his word so that it would help believers walk with him. There are 1,100 instructions in our New Testament. And it is so good to know that God gave them to accomplish a purpose. These words were written 700 years before we had our New Testament. But like we just looked at, they, they carry the same force that they did when they were originally written. So God's word is living and it's active and it's actually sharp. God's word, it reaches into the deepest, most deep recesses of our lives. It penetrates the corners of our lives. It it penetrates the the areas of our life where we don't want to consider. It cuts through all the chaff and speaks to the truth. You know how it is when you're in a conversation with somebody and they've kind of got the word in view, but they've got lots of other things in view and they're explaining things and they're excusing things and, and so forth. And then you bring the word and the word goes right to the point. That's what the author is saying here. It cuts through everything else and and brings truth to bear. But it also judges the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. That is, the word gives itself, gives us a basis by which we can form an assessment of our life. And it is the one and the only and the true basis of assessment for us. So we need to know scripture really, really well, but we need to treasure it. The psalmist is writing and he's saying, your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. I know all of these things about your word. And those things should produce in me an affection for your word that that holds it in exceedingly high esteem. So that when I'm looking at God's word, I have an affection for it that compels me to be obedient to it. So if there's a pattern of sin in your life, then examine the degree to which you actually treasure God's word. When you hold it in your hands, do you you read it like a textbook? Do you read it like you're, you're learning biology or algebra or economics or anything else? Or do you hold it and read it and recognize that you're reading out the the breathed out word of God that he breathed into existence by giving us through the writings of prophets. One practical way to examine this and to grow your affection for God's word is look at what God's word says about itself. I'll just give you two references that have been very helpful for me. I'm building a list myself and the list is long, but uh, two passages that are very helpful are Psalm 138, 2, where uh, God tells us that he has exalted his word according to his name. 
As great as God's name is, that's the same place that his word holds. And Isaiah 66, 2 tells, you know, to whom God looks. God looks with favor upon the one who um, trembles at his word. He's contrite over his sin and he trembles over his word. So grow your affections for God's word. Grow your cherishing of God's word. Grow your treasuring of God's word. So those are five essential characteristics which need to be in play. They need to be in view as you're confronting patterns of sin in your life. Very, very helpful to consider those things and look at them. What I'm going to go through now are are five essential considerations, things that we need to keep in mind. And and again, here, it's not just things we need to think about and let it go. They need to have bearing on on the way we think about our patterns of sin. But they're, they're more considering what Christ has done, what God has done for us. And the first of these, and this was something that was very, very, very helpful to me. Probably 15 years ago, uh, we were sitting over in the, the gym over at Gethsemane where we used to meet. Uh, it was a sweet time, and we were in Romans 6. So look at, consider your new relationship to sin. If there's an ongoing pattern of sin in your life, you may have lost sight of the fact that as a believer, you actually have a new relationship to sin. The first seven verses of Romans 6 are some of the most important verses in the New Testament. They're all important. But these seven verses uh, bring the issue of of your battle with sin in a very, very clear focus. Paul writes to the church in Rome, What are we to say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? In other words, should I just continue in some pattern of sin because I know I'm covered? Look at how he responds at the beginning of verse 2. May it never be. This is the strongest way to say no in Greek. There is no stronger way to say no. May it never be. The language is, in the Greek, it's exceedingly strong. It it sounds more strong and more compelling than it does in the English. And he tells us why in the following verses. He says, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? It's very important that we understand what Paul means when he says died to sin. It doesn't mean we died to the practice of sin, the presence of sin in, his lo- in our lives. What he's saying there, and I think we know this, is we have died to sin's rule in our life. And this is something that's very important for believers to understand. I'm going to read verses 3 through 7 in their entirety, and then I'm going to make some comments because they flow so well. It's good for us to know this. If you don't know this passage Spend some time in this passage. This is so helpful. Paul writes, Do you not know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with sin in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been justified from sin. Other translations say has been freed from sin. So again, if you've died to sin, back in verse 2, what you've died to is sin's rule over you. The picture I want us to have in view here is the throne of our life. And we want to look at who is occupying that throne of our life. And from the point of conception on, um, from the right out of the gate, the one occupying that throne of life for every single one of us is our sin and our self, our own self-will and our own rule. What is taking place here is that that master is being deposed and he is being removed and he's being replaced with Christ. And so there is a new master. And the implications of this, again, are extraordinary. Look at verse 4. We were buried with him through baptism into death. So this is the process by which the old sin, the old master, is being removed. And then the second half of verse 4 helps you see the implications of the, the new lordship of Christ in your life. This is some of the most important verses that I know in the New Testament. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, and he's speaking of Christians, we too might walk in newness of life. That newness of life does not mean sinless of life, 
It means newness of life. You walk with a new master and a new Lord. And the reason why is because that old master has been dethroned from your life. That old master is still in the picture, but he's not on the throne. That old master still appeals, but he does not appeal from the same position of authority over you that he once had. He's over in the corner and he's appealing to you and he's appealing to you. And the believer can say, you know, I I know that you're appealing to me, but you don't hold the same position that you used to. I mentioned this example yesterday morning at Build, and I think it's good to walk through. If you've ever had an employer, a boss, who has been unfair to you and been unkind to you, he's not the ultimate CEO in the organization, but he's over you, and you have to serve him, and he's unkind to you, and he asks you to do things, and he appeals to you, and he blusters, and he flusters, and and you have to follow his beckoning. One day, the CEO of the organization comes in and dismisses him and removes him. He's, he's no longer in a position of authority over you. He can still bluster and fluster and bother you, he can still be unkind to you, but he's not doing so as your authority any longer. You have whoever he replaced him with. That's the picture. We need to understand that sin has been removed. Sin still appeals to us. We know that it appeals to us. We we know it in our own lives. But it's important for us to remember that it appeals to us from a position of no longer being the authority over us. It's so important for the believer to be able to say at the end of Romans 6, 4, I have the ability to walk in newness of life. I am no longer a slave to sin. I don't actually need to respond to that appeal the way that I used to. All of that is because of the new relationship that I have with sin. And all of that is because of what Christ has done for me. He died for me, and he is my Lord, and he is my Savior. By God's grace, I have the faith to believe in him that he's my Lord and my Savior. And so I'm going to follow him, and I'm going to obey him, rather than obeying sin. So, uh, guys, what was really important for us to understand as we look at the end of verse 4 here is that our ability to walk in newness of life is contingent on something. And what that's contingent on is Christ's resurrection from the dead. And if you can raise your hand and say, I believe Christ was raised from the dead, that it was a collective effort between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father. You have the ability to walk in newness of life. So if you believe in the resurrection of Christ, you believe that you have that ability. So study the resurrection of Christ and what it means for you. So practically speaking, In the moment of conflict, in the moment of temptation, there is something that we need to do. We need to remind ourselves that we have the ability to walk in newness of life. You don't have to respond the way we formerly did, whether that was five years ago, five months ago, 42 years ago. We have to remind ourselves that we don't have that, that we have that ability to walk in newness of life. But out of conflict, out of that time of where sin is appealing to us, Ask God to grow your love for walking in that newness of life. Walking in newness of life is so sweet. It is so right. It is so good. It's what God designed us to do. Ask God to grow our affection for that and experience it and love it and cherish it. At the end of every day, when you put your head on your pillow at night, rejoice in all of the ways in which God gave you the grace to walk in that newness of life. Something else that we need to be very mindful of that we need to consider is Christ's work in our place. This is very helpful. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to spend most of our time in verse 21. We're also going to look back in verses 14 and 15. And the idea here is we we can't lose sight of the scope of our sin. I I mentioned that at the very beginning in Psalm 130. It's it's in front of us here, especially as we go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who knew no sin, sin. Think of Christ, the one who spoke this universe into existence. He spoke into existence light and the heavens and the objects in the heavens and all that we see. God made the sinless one sin. The creator of the whole universe bore my sin in his earthly body. He condescended to become a fully man so that he could be my substitute and not my substitute in a good thing but as substitute in bearing my sin before a holy God. But he was fully God, so he was capable of satisfying God's wrath against that sin. It's just sobering to consider what actually happened to the sinless one. He was bearing my sin. 
And there's a great deal of love on Christ's part that compels him to do that. And we see that in verses 15, 14 and 15. The love of Christ, that's Christ's love for us, compels us. That's not our love for Christ. What compels Christ was his love for us. Okay, we need to get that right. Having concluded this, one died for all, therefore all died. He died so that they who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. It's very, very important to remember Christ's work and what the purpose of that work was for. He died so that we wouldn't live in patterns of sin. He, would, he died so that we could leave those behind. I want us to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. There's nothing new here other than the scope of what actually just took place. Uh, 1 Peter 2, we're going to look at verse 24. He bore our sin in his body. So that we would die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you are healed. I don't know about you, but it's very easy for me to blow over those words and read by them and go, oh yeah, there's, there's something weighty there. Uh, and whatever you have to do to help you gain appreciation for the scope of what took place there, do that. I'm going to share with you what's helpful for me. What is helpful for me is to just try to estimate, and I know even the effort is vain, but try to estimate what it is, the, the quantity of sin in my life. And I'm probably way off on this. Um, the people who know me best would say, I'm good for much more than this, but I'm probably good for 10 sins an hour. Um, hopefully not while I'm standing here for an hour, but on average, um, there's that's very nearly 100,000 sins per year. And if you're 58 years old, like I am, you're closing in on 6 million sins against the God who created you. Christ bore every single one of those. And I don't care if that number is a six or a four or a 19 or a three, it doesn't matter. There's an enormous quantity of sin that he bore in his body. And what would take me an eternity to never satisfy any of the father's wrath? Jesus hung on a cross and he satisfied in one day. Mark's gospel tells us in verse 25 of chapter 15, that it was the third hour when they put Jesus on the cross. And it was the ninth hour when they took him down. That means that he was on the cross for somewhere around six hours, whether it was three hours or four hours or five hours, a couple hundred minutes, Jesus was on the cross. And during that time, he satisfied the full weight of the father's wrath against every single one of my sins, millions of them. I can't remember what I did in August of 1993. Can't remember what I did in February of 1974, but there was just a wreck of sin being laid up against the God who created me. And when Christ went to the cross in AD 30, he bore all of them in his body. So it's very helpful for me to remember when I'm entertaining patterns of sin in my life, that Christ actually bore all of those in his body. So that's important. So practically speaking, do some study on what Christ did to satisfy the Father's wrath against you. You know, if uh, the lake of fire is what awaits all of those who don't know Christ in eternity, if I were to stand in that lake of fire for a trillion years, the percentage of God's wrath that I would have satisfied in those trillion years could only have been represented by zeros. Zero percent complete. That's really sobering. So consider Christ's work that he did for two or 300 minutes on a cross to save you from the wrath of God. It's just sobering. Next, I want us to consider our role in the body of Christ. And this is, this is something that's really sobering. We, we talk about the body of Christ, but it's important for us to get a good grasp on that. So let's turn to Colossians 1. We're going to look at Colossians 1, 1 Corinthians 6, and Ephesians 4. Colossians 1 tells us that God rescued us. Don't think that we saved ourselves here. God rescued us. When he rescued us, he's not rescued us from floating in the ocean. He rescued us from drowning in the ocean. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. And he transferred us into the kingdom of his marvelous and his beloved son. So formerly, we're in this kingdom of darkness. We are in solidarity with sin. We are holding on to sin as tightly as it can be held on to. But God placed us into the kingdom of his son. And what's really, really important to us is that kingdom comes with membership. 
And we're going to look at that membership here in 1 Corinthians 6. Paul asks the church in Corinth three times, do you not know? And one of those times he says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? And being a member of the body of Christ is not a group of people who are collected together and Christ has something to do with it. That's not it. That's not what's taking place. This is not a figure of speech, the body of Christ. This is a living organism. This is Christ himself. We are members of Christ. And that comes with function. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and look at what that function is. We're going to look at verses 15 and 16. And this is something that the elders and the leadership of this church just praise consistently. And it really looks like this church knows this, is grasping this, and is running well with this. But I'm going to share this this morning because this is so important to helping us understand how important it is us to realize this as we're engaging with patterns of sin in our life. Verse 15, the way that believers are to function in the body of Christ is to speak the truth in love to one another. We're to grow up in all aspects into Christ. So that is how you grow up in all aspects into Christ is by speaking truth to one another, by having the truth of God's word be a part of your conversations with each other. That when somebody tells you, man, I had a big week, that you bring truth, bring encouragement, you bring comfort that's rooted in God's word. When someone says, oh, I've got this problem with sin in my life. You bring encouragement from God's word. You bring truth. You bring exhortation from God's word. But look at this. We are to grow up in all aspects into Christ, who is the head. Verse 16, we we know this. From whom the body causes the growth of the body. And how does the body cause the growth of the body? You look in the middle of the verse and it tells you exactly how that happens. They are joined and held together by what every joint supplies. Brother and sister in Christ, Christian, you are a joint. You are a member in the body and you are essential for the body being held together. It's not just the leadership of the church. It's not just your small group leader. It's not just the deacons at this church. Every single member is essential because they are what joins and holds the body together. But how do they do it? They do it by supplying to one another what each part needs. And they do that according to the properly measured working of each individual part. Each part needs to be functioning properly. So the idea here is that if you're not maintaining a a holy life, If there's a pattern of sin in your life that's it's keeping you from leading a holy life, it is damaging your function in this body. You just have to think about how well your body works when some part of your body doesn't work well. I had my hip replaced a few years ago. My hip wasn't working well and I couldn't even reach down and tie my shoes. A number of years ago, uh, this is, this is a really good experience to share. I was teaching a class about 15 years ago and a good brother came to me very quietly and very humbly. And he said, I want to talk to you. And I was really thankful that he did. He came to me and he said, would you come over to my house? I went over to his house and I thought, oh, great. I'm going over to my friend's house. This will be a good time. And it ended up being a really good time because my brother was functioning really, really well in his own walk with the Lord. And so he was able to supply to me what I needed on that day. And he made me aware of a pattern of sin that was in my life. I was teaching a class and there was a way in which I was teaching the class that was clearly a pattern of sin and I was blind to it. My brother helped me understand that and it was very, very helpful from that point on. And uh, I'm very, very thankful of that. But the point in all of this is that that wouldn't have been possible if my brother wasn't caring well for his own heart, if he wasn't taking care of patterns of sin in his own life. He was able to function well that day because... He was guarding his heart from patterns of sin in his life. So uh, if there is a pattern of sin in your life that you know is there and you know it is ongoing, consider your role in the body of Christ and the harm that that pattern of sin brings to the body of Christ. You just can't speak with integrity. You can't speak with a clear conscience to your brother when you're discussing the matters of God in your life and how it's so helpful to you. So very practically speaking, Consider the one another's in scripture. If you need a nice big long list of them, we have an elder who knows those really, really well. Go see him. He can help you. And just ask yourself how your ability in each of those one another's is compromised by your own participation in a pattern of sin.
We want to also keep in mind and consider the enemy's strategy whenever it is that you're maintaining a pattern of sin. Let's go to first, first Peter chapter five. We're going to look at verses eight and nine. We want to make something very, very clear here. When someone comes to Christ, when they experience new life in Christ, there's something that's particularly magic that happens. I shouldn't say magic, powerful that happens. And that is that uh, that person's salvation is secure in Christ. It is accomplished, is done. Your place in eternity is as good as if you were already there. That doesn't mean that the enemy doesn't have a, a pursuit of you. He pursues you not knowing, uh, knowing not that you're, that he can win you over because you've been won by Christ, but he pursues you to affect your effectiveness in the body of Christ. First Peter five, eight, he's described as your adversary. We know what an adversary is. It's one who works against you. So in his appeals to you, when the appeal is attractive, it's important to remember that he is against you, but he's prowling around. What is he doing for the believer? He is looking for the believer and he wants to devour their effectiveness for Christ. So Peter gives the instruction in verse nine. This is so helpful to us as we consider this strategy of the enemy. The strategy for the believer on the believer is to induce them into ignoring the joy and the privilege and the right function of being in the body of Christ. He wants to draw us away from the activity that we love so much that we enjoy here, we enjoy in small group, we enjoy in our homes, we enjoy with our friends in Christ. He wants to take us away from being effective in those things. So Peter says, resist him. But he gives clarity on how it is that we are to resist him. We don't resist him by standing in the corner and gritting our teeth. We resist him being firm in the faith. And so what does that mean? That means we remember the gospel. It's really helpful for me to remember Ephesians 2 as I'm firm in the faith. I remember the kind of person that I was prior to 1981, just full of sin. I lived in my sin. I was swimming in an ocean of sin. And I was by nature just like everybody else. And I was walking in that sin. It was an active sin. But verse, tell, verse 4 tells me that God made me alive. He raised me up and he seated me in the heavenly places. And verse 8 tells me he did that by his grace. It wasn't anything that I did. It was what he did. And verse 10 in Ephesians 2 tells me that God did all of those things and he has works prepared for me to walk in. That's one summary of the gospel. You can go 19 other places in your New Testament and find a, a similar summary. That's what it means to resist the devil in the faith. Firm in the faith with a, a confident understanding of what God did to save you and the purpose that he did, how he brought you into his kingdom to use you for his glory in the life of other people. James tells us in chapter four, verse seven, that when you resist the devil, he will flee from you. He knows that the appeals of, that he gives you pale in comparison to the realities that are in view for the believer. He knows that. And when you're keeping those realities in view and you're living in light of those realities, you're reminding yourself consistently of those realities. The enemy goes elsewhere. He's, there's more fertile fields someplace else. And that's God's promise to you. That's why the, uh, the very end of Romans 13, Paul says in verse 14, make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Make no provision. Just make no room in your life for the enemy to enter into your life and toy with you with some, some opportunity for sin. Jesus knows this. 30 years before Paul wrote Romans 13, Jesus taught this in Matthew 5. And we know this. If if your right eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it from you because it is better for you to go through this life without one of the members of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. He doesn't say if it's just your eye. He says if it's your hand. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it far from you. Same thing. Better for you to go through this life missing a part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So inform yourself of how the enemy seeks to impede your function in the body of Christ. And a pattern of sin plays right into that. Lastly, I wanted to end with this. Uh, it's very important to consider God's work in you. Let's go to Philippians 1. We're going to look at Philippians 1 and 2. We're also going to look at 2 Peter chapter 1. God's purpose in saving the sinner is to reconcile them to him and to enjoy a love relationship with them. 
And that love relationship is characterized by an increasing obedience, an increasing love, an increasing service to him, increasing utilization in the body of Christ. You can see that in your own life. It's really encouraging. Look at what Paul says to the church in Philippi. In verse 6 of chapter 1, I'm very confident of this thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. And the original language there talks about a certain completion that is taking place on the day of Christ, that God is working in you. It's an ongoing activity. It is something that is certain that is going on and God will achieve his end objective. That is of sanctifying the believer to the point that he has them to be sanctified when he takes them to be with him. He will perfect it. But if we turn the page to chapter two, we see how he does that. And he does that by providing the means. We're going to look at verses 12 and 13. Paul writes, So, beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So that sounds like what we're going to do is we're going to get over there and we're just going to try really, really hard. Well, it does involve effort, but it does, involve, it does not involve effort of us standing in the corner running as hard as we can. Because look at verse 13. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and work for his good pleasure. So what we do not want to take away from this is God's doing everything. That's why you look back and you look at the end of verse 12, work out your salvation. That's an imperative command to the believer. But God is at work in you. That means that God is providing you the means to work out your salvation. You don't do it on your own strength. You do it by submitting yourself to his design for us as how we would live. And it is on that basis that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. God is the one who will accomplish it, giving you the desire, giving you the means to do what you wish for him. So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. This is our last passage. I'm going to read this passage in its entirety. This is a sweet passage. This tells you what God has done for the believer There are massive implications for us as it relates to patterns of sin. Peter is writing 2 Peter chapter 1. He writes, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust if you haven't memorized those passages or these verses here consider doing so this is so helpful to keep in mind god has called us from the context of his own glory and excellence he didn't call us as an afterthought he called believers with his own glory and excellence from that context. So it is a magnificent calling. But in that calling, he's given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. In his wisdom and his existence outside of time and space, he knows everything that will enter into our lives because he is the one who brings it into our lives. And he is the one who gives us the grace to walk in those circumstances. He's called us by his own glory and excellence. And by those two things, his glory and excellence, he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by those things, we can become partakers in his divine nature. So his glory and his excellence compel him to bestow on us what we need to live a holy life. And you know what it is to have something bestowed on you. It's something that is given to you for a purpose. That's what God did. He gave us everything we need for life and godliness for his purpose. So that is God's work in us. So study what God has done for you and what he is doing in you and use that as a means of walking in repentance from any pattern of sin in your life. So those are 10 principles we need to keep in front of us. And again, there are many, many more. Like I said at the beginning, there's no mention here of the Holy Spirit, no mention of bearing in mind our testimony to the lost world around us, Uh, There's not a lot of things here about some other issues as well, and there should be. But these are 10 things that I'm trying to import into my own life and help me walk in newness of life. 
And I pray the same thing for you. So let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are kind and good to us and you have given us your word. You've given us your word so that we can know you. We can understand you. We can understand your nature. Lord, it is sobering for us to realize we will never plumb the depths of your word. We will never understand it completely and understand it fully, but we beg for your grace to understand it well so that we could live lives that are pleasing to you. I pray for myself and I pray for every believer in this room. Lord God, that you would grant us grace to walk in that newness of life. What a joy it is to know that sin is no longer our master. Lord, I pray for all of the ones who are sitting here this morning, hearts beating, who have not submitted to the Lordship of your Son, the Savior. Lord God, I pray that they would know that they have no hope of turning from patterns of sin until they submit to the Lordship of your Son in their life. Lord God, I pray that you would pull back the veil that is in front of their eyes and remove the scales from their eyes. And you would shine the light of the gospel into their dark mind so that they could know the gospel of the glory of Christ and the goodness of following him, that he is a worthy, he is a better master. So God, I, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you accomplish everything you intend with your word. Well, Lord God, I pray that it would attend to us today. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.